It's going to be a Jim Dandy of a party. Yeah. Party coming up on Cannery Row. Cannery Row. Hear the rumble over Cannery Row. Hear the rumble over Cannery Row. Rumbling, mumbling, murmuring, blow. Rumbling, mumbling, murmuring, blow. Like a cyclone ready to blow. Like a cyclone ready to blow. Getting ready to pop, getting ready to bust, getting ready to blow. this means to you with Pipe Dream being done here at Encore? Okay, um, having the privilege of representing the Rodgers and Hammerstein canon from Oklahoma to Sound of Music, um, there are a few stepchildren along the way, and Pipe Dream is one of them. It didn't work the way they, the guys intended it when it was first done in the 1950s. And it, when Encore started, it was one of those titles that people said, someday Encore should take a look at it. So a, a, a very interesting circuitous route brings us here. And I, I'm thrilled. I mean, very, very few people have actually seen Pipe Dream. And that's what Encores is about. What excited me the most is the original orchestration. Talk about that. Okay, um, we have an extraordinary man who's our director of music at Rogers and Hammerstein named Bruce Pomahack. Um, he was the conductor of Meet Me in St. Louis. He can, he's orchestrated for Broadway, but he came to me several years ago and wanted to organize our archive. And a summer job has turned into a lifetime uh, role at, at Rogers and Hammerstein. And he, when the minute that Encore said we want to do Pipe Dream, he dove in to the restoration of the score from beginning to end. And because of the nature of the original production, starring Helen Trabel, who was an opera singer, and Judy Tyler, who has a very low voice, one of the first things he discovered is the keys in the original production were changed for both of those ladies. So it brings up a very interesting question when you're doing an encores. What was, as, as the Germans say, urtext? What did the composer and the lyricist desire the fact of the matter is what they desired was a good show. So they adjusted the keys, and this gives this cast of extraordinary performers the ability to see if Laura Osnes is more comfortable with a higher key, if Leslie Uggam's a little lower, than because actually Fauna, the opera singer's keys were raised, and Susie's keys were lowered. So again, it's, that's, you know, the musical theater is a fluid collaboration, and this is just another step in the collaboration of Pipe Dream. So how excited are you like to be in the rehearsal room the last week and when it opens here? Well, I'm thrilled to see it. This morning I listened to some of the original cast album, which I've always felt was not the best cast album. It wasn't all that well recorded. I think people wanted to get through it. So this morning I listened to some of the original cast album and I got very excited about the idea of hearing those songs. I mean, keep in mind, Rodgers and Hammerstein, the sound of music was coming up, so they hadn't lost their talent. But to hear what these two guys who were great storytellers, how they took this Steinbeck story and translated it into musical theater terms, even if it didn't work brilliantly, let's hear what it sounded like. I'm ready. This has a fun score to it. it. Yeah. Now, it was your idea to do Pipe Dream? It kind of was, yeah. I mean, I, I mean I'm a huge Rodgers and Hammerstein fan, always have been since I was a little kid. And I've always been curious about this show. It always seemed kind of mysterious to me, like what was this show? It's based on such great material, the Steinbeck novels. It has a lot of great songs in it. And I just, and no one has done it. No one's been able to do it for many, many years. So ever since I've been here at Encores, I kind of been, been needling Ted Chapin a little bit, saying, what about Pipe Dream? Can we do Pipe Dream? And finally he worked it out so we could do it. And uh, I'm very excited because no one knows this show really. No one's ever seen it I'm, in many, many years, at least. And and um, this is it. I mean, no one's going to probably do it much after this. But we, we're doing it with a big orchestra, a wonderful cast, as good a cast as you could ever imagine for this. And so, I just feel like what we—it's perfect show for encores because we're saying, look, folks, this is what it was. This is a, a, a you know, frankly, a lesser show by Rodgers and Hammerstein. It wasn't one of their big hits. But isn't it interesting and fascinating to take a look at this now? Now, I, I want to talk about the orchestration, how it was found, how it was redone. Well, basically, the original scores by Robert Russell Bennett, his full scores, and the original orchestra parts that they played off in the original Broadway production, Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, organization and Bruce Pomahack, who's the music director there, they had all this material. I mean, they had it all. And so what Bruce did over the course of over a year, he and his team, is they 
basically took that material and created a brand new set of orchestra parts, scores. Um, so, you know, we're working from clean, edited, proofread, you know, corrected material. So it's been, a, it's been easy for us, thanks to Bruce, who is, you know, a hero. That must be like the ice cream, you know, you know the yeah. whipped cream on top of a sundae for you. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, again, the fact that R&H had, of course, an interest in seeing this show go and, and having the materials updated. So, um, uh, you know, they did uh, so much of that work for us, which we're very grateful for, but now we get to do it. So. So what has the experience been like so far? Um, the thing with encores, I think especially nowadays, is that the expectation has come to be that it's almost a full production and people hold scripts but they never look at them. And so uh, we're trying to find that balance of you know, letting, making sure we let the audience know that we've only had a week and a half of rehearsal, but also trying to be as prepared as possible with the time that we've had. And um, of course it's hard to be glued to a script and connect with the person that you're having the scene with. So, um, but even after a few days, I feel like we've done it enough. We're already starting to get very familiar with the script um, and just being free to kind of play around and, you know, let the audience know that we had a week and a half of rehearsal and we're presenting the material for what it was. And um, you just have to embrace, embrace that part of the process. That's a great way to look at it. Talk about the role. Did you know the show? I did not know this show. Most people did not and, and don't. It hasn't been done for 50 years and um, it's exciting to kind of be able to give it a second life. Um, Susie, my character, is uh, kind of bumming from town to town, semi-homeless, finds herself in Monterey, uh, broke a store window to get some food and ends up going to Doc's lab for him to fix her hand up. <laughs> and um, throughout the course of the play she kind of challenges him with what he's doing with his life and he feels like he needs to kind of step up to the plate for this girl he hardly knows and throughout all of the bickering challenges they end up falling for each other um, and they both I think they both kind of have that need and longing to belong and have a home and they find that with each other. And let's talk about the score, some of the songs you get to sing. Sure. Um, Susie's kind of main anthem is a song called Everybody's Got a Home But Me. And she sings it. Um, it's her first song in the show. And I think it really kind of establishes who she is and what she really wants, despite her kind of rough exterior and her her kind of tough attitude of I'm fine, I'm independent, she really has a deep longing to be loved and to be taken care of and to belong somewhere. Um, so that, that song kind of puts it right out there. It's a lovely song, absolutely beautiful. So I know you know some of the Rodgers and Hammerstein canon, so what has it been like learning this school and yeah. what you think of it? Um, several of the songs remind me of a lot of other Rodgers and Hammerstein songs, and some of them are completely random and different. <laughs> um, overall, the show definitely has like the r &H stamp on it, and you can tell it kind of has the grace and elegance that um, a lot of their shows tend to have. But uh, it's, it's fun because nobody knows the music, and we get to kind of visit it for the first time and kind of make it our own. There's nothing, there's no preconceived notion of what it is or what it was. Um, so it's, it's exciting. I was so thrilled. You know, Pipe Dream, I never knew. I didn't either. I was so excited. Then I saw the cast and I was like, yes. <laughs> How do you feel? Oh, you know, kind of thrown in the middle of things. It's actually like, it's like doing summer stock. Uh, and I've done my share of summer stock and somebody else's uh, back in the day. But, um, you know. I've had the chance to, to do the leads in, in a bunch of them, you know, like Carousel and Oklahoma and South Pacific, but I've never even heard of this when they asked me to do it, and I had no concept of what it was, but once I saw the names and it, oh, 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 Steinbeck, okay. So, I mean, it's, it's something, there's something about looking at a writer's um, failures that I think is really instructive, and... Uh, I mean, I know as, as being a songwriter that some of the crap that I've written that wasn't very good helped me get to the places where I could write good stuff, you know, help define what, what the good stuff was. 
and there are moments of brilliance in this score. And uh, it's, a, it's really, really been an education and a real trip. And it, the cast is great. The kids are great. Laura and Will are terrific. Now, who do you play? Talk about your I role. I play Mac. I play the kind of the leader of the flop house, where the, the big bunch of bums live like in an old fish mill warehouse. And so I'm kind of like the unofficial mayor of Cannery Row. You know? so what songs do you sing out of the school? I sing basically a, a couple of, uh, uh, I lead a couple of big chorus numbers. No ballads for me in this one, but um, <laughs> uh, there's a song called Tide Pool at the beginning that you will not forget soon, for whatever reason. Um, there's one about a party that we're going to do, and there's, then there's one where they describe the kind of lifestyle that this bunch of bums lives, and it's called Lopsided Bus. So it's interesting stuff. And just Encores itself, what this organization means to you, Tom, now that you're working it. Well, this is my first experience, but the... I think it's, there's a real value in having an organization like this that revives things, that, again, that weren't successful, but were written by people who had a, a great number of big successes. I think you know, there's a real value in that to get the perspective of, of, uh, of like a composer's complete set of work. So when you came into the rehearsal room, what did people tell you what Encores was going to be like? Well, I, I had talked to some people already who had been a part of it, and uh, I, had, I had done some productions in, in Chicago for the Ravinia Festival, which is basically based on this, this, this format. So I was used to the idea of let's throw an entire Broadway musical together in less than two weeks, basically. So I knew what to expect. Um, I kind of love that process. I think uh, I personally sometimes think better when I've got less time to think about it. And uh, so just knowing that you're, we're going to throw all these elements together, costumes, uh, lights, full orchestra, choreography, all of it in under two weeks, very exciting. Talk about the role, and did you know the show very well? No, that's a great thing. Most people don't know this show. So it is essentially, to most people, a brand new Rodgers and Hammerstein musical, as if they had been hiding for 40 years and decided, well, we're going to try one more. Um, I had heard of it. I literally knew nothing about it. I heard some of the cast album. Um, I know a few of the songs had been in, been put in State Fair in the recent revival. But other than that, nothing. Um, I hadn't read the Steinbeck novels. I'm reading them now, actually. So I I, I personally am approaching this with completely fresh eyes, which is kind of exciting because I don't have any frame of reference to work off of, and I, I kind of just am going on my own devices, which is always great as an actor, so you don't have to, you know, it's not like you're doing Fanny Bryce, you know, and being compared to Streisand. I don't think many people are going to remember the original cast of this show, so. Talk about the role. Uh, so I'm playing Hazel, um, obviously, because I'm a large man with a beard. Uh, no, uh, Hazel is sort of the outsider in the in the, the flop house. This is Cannery Row, 1955. Um, he's not the brightest of the bulbs, and he's ribbed, uh, uh, you know, incessantly because of that. But of course, he's completely lovable. I kind of love the fact that I'm sort of the biggest guy in the cast, and I have the smallest brain. Um, I kind of love playing those roles. <laughs> <laughs> working with this company. Oh, it's so exciting. I mean, you've got, the, the second I heard uh, uh, Leslie Uggams especially, I mean, you've got this combination of, of the, the up-and-coming crop of, of Broadway, you know, staples like Laura Osnos and Will Chase, um, and then you've got somebody who's, you know, pretty much a legend like Leslie Uggams. Um, it's this great combination, and everybody, I think, is just perfectly suited for the show, and it's a... Everyone's just as nice as can be, too, so that always helps. You start blind, her cigarette, and all at once you love her. You scarcely talk, you scarcely. Encore's history. <laughs> My Encore's history. Uh, I did Bells Are Ringing, when was that, a year and a half ago with the lovely Kelly O'Hara. And uh, the madness continues. It's another fun Encore's weird, obscure piece of musical theater. So does it help when you've already done one? 
Yes, because the first one is petrifying. Doesn't make this any less petrifying. You just know what that's going to be like. You're like, we're doing a run through tomorrow and we haven't blocked some scenes. But that's, that's the adrenaline thing and it makes it a lot of fun. Let's talk about Pipe Dream. Talk about the role. And did you know the show? Not at all. The weird thing about this one was, at least Bells Are Ringing, I didn't, you know, I knew some of the music, or you know where it exists in the canon. Or if they ask you to play a role that, you know, it's like Curly. If you've never played Curly, you're like, at least I know what people do with that. This is crazy. I mean, this is Steinbeck's characters. Cannery Row uh, wrote uh, Sweet Thursday with a musical in mind. And who would have ever thought you would set these weird, weird characters to music? But the thing I like about Encores, we leave our contemporary sensibility at the door and we just celebrate this music and this piece and this weird group of well-meaning, well-meaning uh, uh, morons. No, well-meaning people. Talk about the role. Uh, Doc, based on a real character, Ed Ricketts, who was Doc in a lot of Steinbeck's uh, uh, books. He was uh, Casey in Grapes of Wrath, uh, a real guy. Uh, again, a weird character to write a musicale about, but he is a marine biologist, and he sings about fish and things, and then falls in love with the girl, of course. Uh, and there's there are some lovely, lovely songs. Uh, the, um, uh, All at once, you love her. I think there were a couple stolen from this piece, put in State Fair. I don't know which ones, but uh, yeah, it's it's again, it's a lovely celebration of this music, and Doc is at the the kind of center of it. And working with this company. Tom Wopat, man. I used to listen to Tom Wopat in school. And uh, then when I walked in, he, I said, why the long face? He said, because uh, the, that's the role I used to play. But uh, no, I'm loving that. Uh, Laura Osnes, awesome. And Leslie Uggams, hello. I mean, she was off book the first day, which was very scary. She sings a reprise of the song I sing, All at Once You Love Her. And I watched her do it twice yesterday in tears both times. I said, okay, we have to stop singing this because I will cry all of my mascara off. Tell me, just sum up Encores, what it is and what it means to you. Again, I mean, I've just said this three times, but I think Encores is that you leave your sensibility, your contemporary musical theater sensibility at the door. You, you lift up this piece and say, what is this piece offering? Just as a piece. There's no comment on it. You know, I think a lot of people expect a revival to come out of here or something like that. And uh, you just celebrate the music. Rob Berman and the 30-piece orchestra. You get to hear it the way Robert Russell Bennett, who did the orchestrations, intended. Uh, and the book, the way it's intended. And uh, it's just a lovely celebration of that. You can't catch a fish without a worm of the bait. You can't Unless you sit and wait And staring a bear is no snap A seedling is hard to catch and hard to take A mom and animals we call our game A man is the only one that you can name Who tries to get caught in a trap well, here you are. This is your first encore. I'm so excited. This is really great. Yes, uh, I'm a virgin. <laughs> I love that. What did you hear about encores? Because you've come to see some of the shows, right? Yes. I heard that uh, it's fast. So I, I, I tried to come as prepared as possible with the material. <laughs> we'll chase it. Leslie's already off book already. <laughs> first day of rehearsal. I'm like, that's how it used to be done, that's right? Right, exactly. I mean, the first Broadway show I did was Hallelujah Baby, and I didn't know any better. I knew the whole script, and for the reading, I sat there, and everybody was with their scripts, and they looked at me like, she's going to be trouble. <laughs> You're a star. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, a, that's how I've always worked. So let's talk about this show. Talk about the role you're going to play. I am a madam of a bedello, but uh, she's really kind of like the mother of the town, uh, very nurturing, not only to her girls, but to the guys that live in the town. And her place is kind of the place where the food comes from. And, you know, she makes sure that the guys are, are well fed and everything. And she's a romantic and she wants her girls always to get married eventually. And so, of course, the two characters in this show, Doc and Susie, she's hoping that maybe she could fix them up and uh, they'll get together and get married. You know, this is one of the lesser known Rodgers and Hammerstein. It's got a beautiful score, doesn't it? It has an incredible score. And I remember hearing it when I was a kid, two of the songs, uh, All at Once You Love Her, and uh, everybody's got a home but me on the radio. So, and you know, back then, a lot of the, the stars like Perry Cohen, those people, would record songs from a show. And uh, th those two songs are very popular. 
Which songs will you be singing in the show? Well, my song, well, I do a reprise of All at Once You, you Love Her, but I also do a, 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 what they call the Bums Opera, which has a lot of words. <laughs> and then a, the, a great song called Sweet Thursday, which is one of those songs that once you hear it, you it keeps in your head, which is how shows used to be written. You always went out humming something from the score. And working here with this company so far, talk about them. Oh, so fabulous. Well, first of all, I mean, Will Chase, please. You know, I, I watch him on Smash, and he's smashing, let me put it that way. And uh, sweet. And Laura, she's wonderful. And, and, and we've got Tom, and it, it's, it's, it's such an amazing cast, and we all like each other. We've all bonded, and it makes the process much easier. And just what Encores means to you, the type of shows they do in the organization? Well, you know, the great thing about, for instance, Pipe Dream, this is a show that was not successful. And this gives an opportunity for an audience to see a show that they never got to see, maybe never even heard of, but it's a, by great writers, Rodgers and Hammerstein. And that's what Encores does. They try to find shows either that have, haven't been done in a long, 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 long time, or shows that were not successful. And this is a great opportunity, and, and that's what makes this place so magical. Okay.